hauntings are a contentious topic. Those going through them experience some of the worst trauma known to us as humans. Those on the outside looking in can usually point a finger at mental health issues or a deteriorating family situation. I can never help but think, what if it is real? What if it's all real? Hearing these people go through the worst atrocities you can set your mind to is truly terrifying. Possibly just as bad is the thought that maybe it's a hoax. Perpetrated events used for financial gain or sympathy. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, or someone who just wants to hear the story, this is one that can go in all different directions. For this week's story, inspired a book on the matter, and would eventually go on to create one of the more well-known horror films of the late 2000s. I'm your host Nick, and this is Chapter 27 of the Insidious Agenda Podcast, the story of the Snedeker family, or as it's more well known, The Haunting in Connecticut. In 1986, a young couple named Carmen and Al Snedeker were living in a town in northern New York. The couple would often make long-distance trips in support of medical care for Carmen's son, Philip, who, at the time, was suffering from Hodgkin's lymphoma. For those who are unaware, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a type of cancer that affects the lymphatic system and forms a part of the body's germ-fighting immune system. In Hodgkin's lymphoma, white blood cells, known as lymphocytes, grow out of control, causing swollen lymph nodes and growths throughout the body. Unfortunately, the trip the couple had to make each time was unsustainable, and it began to take a toll on them financially. Carmen and Al, looking to move somewhere closer to the destination of the medical treatments, were able to find an apartment. The apartment was one of two built into an old colonial-style home in Southington, Connecticut. The apartment would be spacious enough for the couple, their three sons, their daughter, and Carmen's nieces Tammy and Kelly. To Carmen and Al, this was the perfect house. The Snedekers, both young and older, moved into the amazingly affordable home at 208 Meriden Avenue on the 30th of June in 1986. When they arrived, each of the children ran off to select their new bedroom, whether it was because of having been a teenager, his illness, or a teenage love of seclusion. Philip decided that he would have a room in the basement. This, of course, would require some minor renovations done by Al. It was during those renovations that the house wasn't as normal as it had initially appeared. Al was a former stonemason, so construction was nothing new to his world. He discovered mortuary equipment. Things like coffin handles, a chain and pulley lift that was used for caskets, and the most pleasant of all, a blood drainage pit. As they would soon discover, and as evidenced by the findings, the home had served as a funeral home for decades prior to the family's arrival. Not thinking too much of the morbid past, Al pressed on with the conversion of the basement room into a bedroom for Philip. The room he would stay in was the old casket display room, and it was just down the hall from the former embalming room. The family didn't only notice things left behind in the basement, but there was scattered furniture that remained behind throughout the entire home. They found old dressers, some with photographs inside, and many of which showed bodies being prepared for funeral. Others would contain other miscellaneous items, and some even had former pieces of coffins. 
Possibly the biggest shock they received was when they discovered headstones on the property. Not those in stock or awaiting a forever home, but those already installed in the ground, indicating that bodies had been buried on the property. The Snedekers inquired with the town's assessor, who confirmed that it was indeed the Hallahan Funeral Home for a number of years. Although this did bring some initial concerns, finances were also a big issue, as well as the proximity to their son's doctors and his medical treatments at the University of Connecticut Hospital. All of that had to be taken into consideration. One thing that's important to note here, as it pertains to the fiscal situation, is that it's believed to have predated Philip's diagnosis with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Philip was the first to notice something was wrong. From the very first night, he would begin to hear strange voices and could even see shadow figures. One of the more alarming things he would see those first nights was the presence of a man. He wore a pinstripe suit. He had black eyes and long black hair that ran all the way down to his hips. Philip noticed him skulking in the dark corner of his room. And curiously enough, this man's feet never seemed to stop moving. He would later state that the man never took his eyes off of him, and it were as though he was watching him even while he slept. The spirit began to speak to Philip, sometimes having general conversation, or even calling out his name. While on other days, he would be angry, irate, and would even threaten Philip. The home also had a dumbwaiter system in the walls, the chains of which would rattle at all hours even though it wasn't in use. Voices would whisper, and other strange noises could be heard inside of it. It was originally used to connect the main floor and the entry to the mortuary in the basement, that room being the room Philip was using for a bedroom. Coldness was also an issue. The family noticed one of the rooms upstairs was ice cold in the middle of July, while a seemingly adjacent room was normal temperature. Though he began to be going through complete remission, things would eventually grow on Philip and become so dark that he began to insist spending every night at the hospital. As much as he professed what he saw to be true, he, like most haunted children, was dismissed. He wasn't the only one to complain, as the other children in the home did as well. But Alan Carmen chalked this up to overactive imaginations of children. Because of some of the treatments he was receiving for his diagnosis, Philip was believed to have suffered from hallucinations. Though he would be dismissed, Philip's parents were experiencing strange things as well. They would recall having heard voices and noticing items disappearing. But it would be in the basement that Philip began to change, and his personality would shift. He took a liking to wearing leather, and had an ever-growing fascination with the occult. He would also take to writing poems that had necrophiliac undertones in nature. Carmen even took notice of Philip playing cruel jokes on other members of the family. He even went so far as to lock his little brother in a chest, and then completely proceeded to forget that he left them there. But he wasn't doing this for show. Whatever was in that basement with him began to affect him. He began to grow violent, even at one point going so far as to break into his neighbor's house attempting to get a gun, which he planned to use on Al, his stepfather. The staff at his hospital would even make note that he had a weird change in his personality and would lash out at staff members. At one point, Philip also attempted to rape his female cousin, which would end up being the last straw. His parents had Philip arrested. While in holding, Philip was given a formal mental health evaluation and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. When he was released, Having no choice but to send Philip away from the home, 
due to his temperament and behavior. Carmen and Al would send him to live with other relatives. This accomplished two things. One, for Philip, he would proclaim that as soon as he left, he immediately stopped hearing voices in his head. The second thing was accomplished for the entity, as sending Philip away, the object of its obsession. The Snedekers would find no solace, and things would get worse. Paranormal phenomena began to twist its way through the halls of the home and terrorize the other children. They would complain of seeing shadow figures, like Philip did, hearing footsteps and voices. But it wasn't only the children that were frightened. While mopping the floor one day, Carmen claimed to have witnessed her bucket of mop water turn the color of blood in front of her eyes. She would later say, The mop water was blood red. I mean a deep, deep red. It made my skin crawl. I started getting nervous that I was ruining the floor. Some of the strangest initial happenings that Carmen and Al experienced was in their bedroom. No, not sexual things, although those who already know this story know that's coming later. Both had made many complaints that their bed would vibrate in an almost rhythmic, heartbeat-like pattern. Whatever was in that room with them would also tug at and lift the sheets on the corners of their bed. The strange behavior of the bed was also confirmed by various visitors who came to the house. The house itself would even begin to exhibit strange behaviors. The Snedeker's home had an unnatural glow to it. This strange hue would even persist even if the light bulbs were removed and all switches were turned off. Al even grew a great distaste for the high electric bills the family were getting believing that his children were all sleeping with the lights on. Which, even if they were, we can infer by this point that it was for good reason. So Al went around the house and removed all of the light bulbs in order to gain what he believed was going to be an upper hand on the situation. Nonetheless, the sockets would continue to glow the strange hue as though the light bulbs were still present. Disgusting odors like rotting flesh and decay would even move about the house at strange hours. This type of behavior would normally torment the family for years. Though it was frightening then, whatever was in the home was about to make things much, much worse for them. The entity began to grow increasingly violent. One of the more notable happenings in the beginning of the escalation was when the entity got to Carmen and wrapped her up tightly in a shower curtain so that she had no way to escape. With shampoo covering her eyes, the entity wrapped the shower curtain tightly around her face and neck so she was suffocating. It was in that moment, Carmen knew that whatever the thing was in the house, it was trying to kill her. The curtain had wound itself so tightly around her body and face that she had to scream where she was rescued by Tammy. Tammy also claimed that she felt a hand touch her inappropriately when no other people were around. And as Philip was now out of the home, Tammy would become the object of the entity's desire. She protested on numerous occasions to having been raped by this entity. When it turned its attention to Kelly, she tried to run away from the house. With Carmen chasing behind her, she was repeatedly sexually assaulted by the entity until Carmen caught up to them. Tammy could always sense when that entity was drawing near. She even stated to her Aunt Carmen one night, It's coming. Can you feel it? As Carmen began to embrace the girl, she noticed the impression of a hand creeping up underneath her nightshirt. It was in this moment, Carmen knew they were dealing with the supernatural. But Tammy alone would not satiate the entity's appetite for lust. 
many nights, Carmen and Al claim to have awoken to strange happenings in their bedroom. They could hear mood music from the 1930s permeating the room. This would normally precede the entity raping or sodomizing one or both of them. Carmen and Al, like anyone going through such terrible experiences, wanted to leave the house. They would later claim on national television that they believed it would make no difference as the entity followed them wherever they went. There was only one place that Cameron thought the family could turn. She contacted her local parish priest and the archdiocese who put the family in touch with people who could help. This ended up being stateside paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. While on the phone with Lorraine, Carmen would tell of her attempts to turn to religion in hope of salvation. Now, as we discovered in the haunting of the Smurl family chapter, Lorraine believed that had the Smurls been more religiously attuned, they could have drove their affliction away quicker. Unfortunately for Carmen, she was already attempting that. But when she attempted to pray her rosary, the entity in the home would attempt to rip it out of her hands. The Warrens agreed to help the Snedekers, arriving the following morning and would investigate the home over the next nine weeks. Accompanying them would be paranormal investigator John Zaffis and a myriad of other people to help. Of that haunting, Zaffis would say, All I wanted to do was get my car keys and get the hell out of that house. Compared to that house, all other cases I have been involved in were like dealing with Casper the Friendly Ghost. Through the course of their investigation, the Warrens made note of having witnessed family members being physically assaulted in all manners. Having witnessed many other convincing things, the Warrens would label the Snedeker's entity as demonic. For severity, on a scale of 9 to 10, the Warrens would give it a 9. Even Ed would later go on to say that the house itself was infested with demons. One of the more intriguing pieces of information to come out of the Warrens' investigation was that, through Lorraine's mediumship ability and even some local research, the Warrens were able to discern that one of the morticians, who was previously employed at the home, was convicted of necrophilia and doing unspeakable acts to the dead in his charge. Not only this, but he would engage in the practice under condition of various satanic rituals. Ed believed that it was because of these horrific things that demonic forces were drawn to that house. One night, while John Zaffis was studying some notes on the dining room table, he felt the room grow bitterly cold. He could sense that something was drawing near. He tried, desperately, to get someone else in the living room to wake up, but turned to witness something at the top of the stairs. He noticed a full-blown apparition beginning to form. A horrid, disgusting smell began to fill the air. The noise was immense. It sounded like thousands of flapping wings. Then, the apparition descended towards him. Coming face to face with him, it stated, Do you know what they did to us? Do you know? That was enough to scare the Warren's nephew from the house, and he didn't return for a number of days. This wasn't the only thing that Zaphis experienced during his time here. One night, he underwent an attack of phantomania at the same time as Carmen did, a floor above him. Phantomania is a sort of sleep paralysis that can cause mental and emotional distress to humans and occurs by way of supernatural origin. A pair of local scientific experts even dropped by to debunk some of what was happening. Lorraine recalled the first and only night of their investigation. In the early hours of the morning, she recalled the pair tearing out of the home, so terrified at what they had experienced. They were so distraught 
they didn't stop running, completely moving out of state and never having finished their investigation. The only thing the Warrens could recommend was that a full-scale exorcism be conducted on the house. Unfortunately, this wasn't as simple as just requesting it to be done. They made contact with the Bishop of Hartford, stating that Catholic help was required to remedy the situation. The bishop agreed to send two priests to bless the home for now a second time and to conduct a sacred mass within the walls. Per the account of John Zaphis, and this was corroborated by Carmen, it stated that the two priests visited the house. The mass did not have the effect that was intended. Ed suffered a heart attack during the proceedings and believe this is because the entity blamed him for bringing the two priests into the home, and he was the target of at least one of the demonic entities in there. Ed and Lorraine did believe the mass stirred up everything that was in the house, and though it didn't solve the issue, it severely wounded whatever they were facing. The Warrens, and now the attending priests, would again contact the bishop. He agreed to send a third. This priest was a true Catholic exorcist, and his name was never provided anything more than Father A. by Ed. In 1988, after three hours of an intense exorcism, whatever dark entity that was plaguing that house was gone. Lorraine later recalled that at the height of the exorcism, a tree mysteriously snapped in half and fell across the yard. On a day that was described as being quite clear and ordinary, the theory arose that the entity was cast out of the house and passed through the tree, causing it to break. A conflicting account was given by the Catholic Church a few weeks later, stating that no authorized exorcism was ever performed on the Snedeker's house. After the exorcism was completed, the Warrens would proclaim that the house was cleared of all entities and activity. The family continued living in that house for another two years after the Warren state it was cleared of activity. In 1990, they packed their things and moved to Tennessee. Carmen and her family have always felt drawn to the supernatural, and now she feels as though they live in a heightened state of sensitivity to it. Carmen took to selling real estate, believing that if she never sold a house, you could best bet it was because she knew it was haunted. Carmen and Al would end up separating and were officially divorced in 2005. Carmen now works as a spiritual advisor of sorts. Outside of these facts, after the haunting, the family became relatively obscure and faded into the background, as with most after events of this type. It was really only after the events of the exorcism that the story began to be looked at skeptically. To many onlookers, the story was a complete fabrication. One fact that seems to creep up is the fact that the paranormal events plaguing the family didn't really seem to escalate until they were falling behind on their rent payments. Physical torments and sexual assault by unseen entities were not enough to dislodge the Snedekers from their home. But moreover, it was the threat of eviction. It wasn't only the landlord who would confirm this story. Neighbors of the Snedekers, women named Yvonne and Catherine, confirmed that the issue only set in when the family was notified there would be an increase in their rent. Additionally, Catherine believed that the family had the sequence of events planned right from the moment they moved in. These sentiments were also shared by another person under that roof. If you remember, the house comprised of two apartments, one on the ground level and the other above it. Their neighbor, Sandy, who had never experienced anything supernatural in the building or the premises, worked for the real estate company that the Snedekers had hired to search for their rental. She would state the family, as far as she knew, were made aware that the house was a former funeral home. This fact is also contested by the Snedekers. Sandy would also state that the Snedekers did fall behind on their rent payments. 
But can we really take Sandy's story at face value? When she was put in front of a television camera, she told a completely different story. During that interview, she claimed to have spoken to Carmen Snedeker. Sandy suggested that Carmen take some sleeping pills, as Carmen had previously made complaints about suffering from nightmares. She said Carmen brushed this off, stating, No, it is my father coming to haunt me. I am calling the Warrens. This story, like the majority of which they investigate, was told by the Warrens in a book release. Horror novelist Ray Garten was hired by the Warrens to write the book, In a Dark Place, The True Story of a Haunting. The book was released in 1992. In advance of the book's writing, Garten interviewed each member of the family to get a feel for what they experienced in the home. Among the tragic stories told to him, Garten noticed one thing. I found that the accounts of the individual Snedekers didn't quite mesh. They couldn't keep their story straight. I went to Ed with this problem. And what was Ed Warren reported to have told Ray? Oh, they're crazy. You've got some of the story. Just use what works and make the rest up. Just make it up and make it scary. So, Ray did as he was told. He used what he could. He made the rest up. And he made it scary. Even years later, in 1999, Garton stuck to his original story about his discussion with Ed Warren. He told me not to worry. That the family was crazy. I was shocked, he said. All of the people who come to us are crazy. You think sane people would come to us? He knew I'd written a lot of horror novels prior to that. So he told me just to make the story up, using whatever details I could incorporate into the book and make it scary. The majority of issues on the Snedeker side lie with Carmen. When asked the most common question, Why they never left the house, she would always change her answer depending on who asked it. In one instance, as we already know, she stated that it followed them wherever they went. In another, she claimed she didn't know anything was happening. She would state things only happened to the children, and not her or Al. And this is completely contradictory to their whole story. That included repeated sexual abuse and sodomy, something she told on national television. In all honesty, this, like most cases of the demonic and paranormal, is something we'll never truly know for sure what happened. The family has their side of the story, that they were tormented by something unseen for several years before it escalated into full assault the likes of which would require the intervention of both the Warrens and members of the Catholic Church to remedy. If we look at the family story first, there are several plausible theories and reasons for it being genuine. First, is the state that they were in at the beginning, both mentally and fiscally. They were transporting their son Philip from New York to Connecticut to obtain treatments for his health issues. Adding this to what was, I'm sure, already a busy schedule in their lives, and the raising of their four children, would have been a train on them. Finally, after looking for a place closer to Philip's treatments, they found a place they deemed close to perfect. But their troubles didn't stop. I'm sure, with the United States' as private health care and the already dire fiscal situation they were in, that it would have been a major cause for concern, especially if their fiscal problems predated the haunting. All of this together would have created an incredible amount of negative depressive energy. Where the home was previously a funeral parlor, it would have played host to a number of bodies and spirits passing through over decades of use. When the Snedekers arrived, it may have acted like a defibrillator, waking whatever spirits or entities lay dormant under that roof. But, as stated by both occupants preceding and proceeding the Snedeker family, they have never experienced anything in that house. Well, some possible minor things like things moving and disappearing, though they experienced nothing close to what the Snedekers reported. 
That being said, if they did act like a defibrillator, those preceding them wouldn't have noticed much activity at all. However, those that proceeded them also had the added benefit that the house had just been blessed and exercised, meaning any spirits or demons that once were under that roof were gone. Their son Philip was the first to be victimized by the spirit, the negative energy of which caused a downturn on his personality, which would lead to him doing terrible things, even attacking his own cousin. With an eventual diagnosis of schizophrenia, it might explain away some of his behaviors. There are certain things that can't be placed, however, like the family's claims of a strange hue in the house and the strange smells. Certainly, under threat of demonic influence, anything can be possible. Even the setting itself, a former funeral home, a place centered on death and transition was the perfect setting for something dark to take hold in. On the other side of the coin, we have the fabrication of the story and the complete hoax that it was. Many neighbors of the family have come forward speaking out against the Snedekers. Many former tenants have stated that nothing supernatural has happened while they rented the apartment. The only issue with this is that they weren't there. The neighbors, even Sandy, the tenant above them, may have never experienced any of the phenomena they did. We know from stories like the haunting of the Perrin family and the conjuring we covered in chapter 17 that you can experience a sort of supernatural bubble effect, experiencing an entire myriad of horrors while the person next to you is in bed, sound asleep. Just because they didn't witness anything or hear anything doesn't mean they were chosen to or had the ability to hear it. Whatever was in there, be it a dark entity or demon, may have kept the Snedekers in its own bubble of horrors. With that, a neighbor named Joan Mirabel stated she did notice, quite often, the family gathered outside the home in the middle of the night, stating they couldn't go back inside. The one thing she did have to say was that they never seemed to be afraid, that they seemed perfectly happy, always out there laughing and joking. With this, however, Mirabel has also stated that she witnessed strange green lights coming from some of the windows in the home, and she was even stung by an unseen force on one occasion when she visited. Next, we come to the high point of contention. The money. We already know that the Snedekers were not well off, going through what they had to with their son Philip's treatments. The Snedekers were also reportedly aware of the Amityville haunting and the Lutz family, which coincidentally, the Warrens were also involved in. They knew the Lutzes made out quite handsomely with their profits from the sale of their story. Keeping in mind, this is also how the Warrens made their money. They never took any money for their actual investigations, but instead would be given rights to whatever book or movie deals came out of them. This is where a lot of people tend to lose faith in the Warrens, seeing them as opportunists. If the reported number of cases they assisted with over their career that spanned several decades is any indication of how things worked out for them financially, they only made out well on a handful. If we look at those stories that have done well in retrospect of their case files, we have The Haunting of the Perrins, now known as The Conjuring, The Haunting of the Lutzes, The Amityville Horror, The South End Werewolf, The Enfield Poltergeist, The Smurl Haunting, and now The Snedeker Haunting that has come to be known as The Haunting in Connecticut. Whether the stories are genuine, or fabricated, each has done amazingly well financially in their telling. As for whether a person labels the war in saviors, or opportunists, that is for them to decide. One of the toughest things we go through, with the deep dive into paranormal stories or recountings of great hauntings, is the proof of authenticity. For believers, the majority of stories can be genuine. But for skeptics, 
it's always easy to point the finger at the situation with an air of, well, I didn't see it happen, so it can't be real. It's even more difficult when you take the accounts of these happenings and turn them into books and movies. These publications can really muddle the waters and blur realities of fact and fiction. The Snedeker family story and Ray Garten's book would eventually come forward again in the 2009 movie The Haunting in Connecticut. Though the film is based on the Snedeker family's experiences in their home, Garten states it's important to beware of situations like this. To close our episode, I'll leave you with his thoughts on the movie, and I'll leave it up to you for how they translate to the Snedeker story as a whole. Filmmakers have a long history of touting movies as being based on true stories, when in fact they have little or no connection to any real events. I suspect the movie will begin with the words, based on a true story, be warned. Just about anything that begins with any variation of this phrase is trying a little too hard to convince you of something that probably isn't true. With this, we bring to close the highly controversial story of the haunting of the Snedeker family, the story that would inspire the well-known film The Haunting in Connecticut. I really hope you enjoyed this story, and that you have come away with having learned something or your own new questions about the case. Either way, whether you believe their story was genuine or you remain skeptical, this story had something for everyone. Before you go, remember to subscribe, and please leave us a quick review if you can. It lets me know what you think about the podcast. So come back next Tuesday, because I have a very exciting episode coming. And this is part of the exciting news that I promised last week. Have you ever wondered how psychics and mediums receive and interpret their gifts. How these abilities work in unison with one another. Or do you like hearing stories of spirit, both terrifying and endearing? Then you won't want to miss next week's episode when the Insidious Agenda podcast welcomes its first ever guest, psychic and evidential medium, Rianne Maldonado. Rianne and I sat down for a chat that went well over an hour. She will tell you everything about being a psychic and a medium, how she perceives gifts from spirit, the downright terrifying story of how she learned she was a medium, and then she'll tell us some of her favorite endearing and heartfelt messages from the spirit for her clients. This is an episode in an interview you won't want to miss. So again, before you go, ensure you're subscribed. New episodes release every Tuesday at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But for now, it's time to close the cover of The Insidious Agenda. I'll see you again next week, and thank you for coming back. <laughs>